we have been using your clustering attribute technique to sort our data to improve query performance, but with our workflow tables, this creates a storage growth issue. Do we have to incur this penalty? My clustering attribute technique is where we add the clustering attribute table and resort the data. But so let me describe the issue first with some graphics and, um, and then we'll talk about how we're gonna fix it. When it comes to workflow, workflow cables tables are often a problematic object inside any database because what happens is workflow normally means a table or piece of data goes through various iterations of attributes. I, I've invented this fictional one, but it'll hopefully describe what I mean by a workflow style table. That's, this is similar to what the customer have, obviously with a real example. I have a table called online orders. And so when an order comes in, these are the pieces of information we know. We know when the order was created, we know who the owner of that order is, and we know what they've ordered. In this case, they've ordered a phone, an iPad, or you know, a TV, et cetera. That's the first part of workflow. Once that sale has been requested, now we have to act on it. So what happens is we add more data to it. These columns obviously already exist in the table. They're just all null when we first create the order. As we come along, when someone picks up that order inside my organization, it's initiated on a certain date, it's initiated by maybe some sort of employee number, and then we nominate where those products or those items are going to come from. One's coming from the Sydney warehouse, one's coming from the Singapore warehouse, and this third order is yet to be started. And then orders get worked on and processed and put in boxes and get ready to be shipped, etc. And so eventually they get dispatched. And so these top two orders, once again, get more data. As of before, all these columns already existed. We don't add columns to tables just to add data. They already existed, but they were all null. And now we've updated the dispatched date because it's been sent off and we're saying who it was, FedEx, etc. Workflow tables have a common characteristic of that they start as small rows and the rows get larger and larger and larger. The problem with rows that grow over time is that we have to deal with them in some way or shape or form to ensure we have good performance because this is what happens internally. And this is a very quick recap of something we've already seen in a previous video of mine in terms of percent free, percent used, etc. I insert some rows and they go into a block. And so here's the row, it's small and compact and lots of small rows go into that block. When I update that row, I'm making the row bigger. So it can't go straight back into where it was, especially if it's surrounded by other rows. And so we can't do that. So the row goes into percent free. Now, just because of bad PowerPoint skills here, it's not like broken up into two chunks. The entire row would be moved into that percent free area. I'm just a terrible, I didn't want to make it so small that we couldn't read it. So it looks like it's been split into two there, but it's not. It's the same row, it's just been relocated into the percent free area such that the whole row can sit together. But of course, that's just the first part of the workflow. When we then update it and make it even larger, eventually we run out of percent free space entirely. We can't fit those extra two columns into that full block anymore. And it, but the reason they get full so fast, even with percent free, is because every single row is starting small and growing over time. So what do we do as we've seen in previous videos? We have to migrate that row to a different block, probably where it will fit all the columns all in one chunk and we leave a forwarding address, which kills us in terms of index access performance. We can solve this just by obviously increasing the percent free to make sure that as all those workflow changes occur, it's still gonna fit in the same block. I might choose percent free of 50 because I know that the, grow, the rows are gonna grow by say 50% in size. This solves that problem because I start off with just a few columns populated as I update, it goes in the percent free area. As I update, it still fits in that same block. I've eliminated the migration issue by simply making a large enough percent free to handle the fact that my rows are gonna grow and grow and grow. The drama comes for when you want to do any kind of data maintenance. If I've done this well by using say percent free 50, almost all the rows are gonna to grow to fully populated because at that point they my products have been shipped so here's a typical looking block the vast majority of rows are now all fully padded out and there's a few in there this one sort of it's half been being processed and here's a couple of small rows here that have yet to be even have any kind of extra workflow done to them but the vast majority you'd imagine work you know 
orders come to a close after time will be like this. And so our data is going to be nicely packed. This person said, that's great, but I'm now trying to reshuffle my data to use some linear attribute clustering, which gets you some great index benefits. Uh, I've done a previous video on that. You can find that on my channel. You add linear clustering and then you do alter table move to reshuffle the data to clump it in the particular clustering order you like. But the table is percent free 50. That's a problem because when you do alter table move, we respect percent free 50. So now all my blocks, yes, they've been nicely reshuffled in terms of linear cluster attributes, but I've now got 50% free space in every single block. And as I said, the vast majority of these rows are never going to grow anymore because they're done. They've grown to their maximum size. I got this thing where now the table has a lot of empty free space in it. New orders will eventually come in and fill this up. But while that's going on, my table is going to sit typically at about double the size it needs to. All those benefits I was aiming for with linear attribute clustering perhaps aren't going to be realized now because my table is actually twice as big as it needs to be anyway. Ideally, what we want to do is don't move the full ones. If the rows have filled up to their logical size, then let's not reshuffle them. Don't move them or at least you know don't leave those blocks half empty. That's what comes into what we call the Hacken factor as a technique to do this. Funnily enough, the Hacken factor actually has nothing to do with percent free and clustering, this particular issue we're talking about. The Hacken factor is actually all about dealing with bitmap indexes. So a little bit of background explaining what the Hacken factor is and why we have it, and then we'll circle back to why it's going to be useful here. Bitmap indexes, as people know, are generally used for when you have very low numbers of distinct values and you want to get some good indexing benefits where a B tree index might not help. Without jumping into a full length expose of how bitmap indexes work, ultimately the elements that go into the bitmap index blocks look like this. We have a key, a start and ending row ID pair, and then a number of bits. Now to help explain what, how, why this, it is like this, let's expand upon this. A common, very low uh, distinct number of values entry might be gender male, female, unspecified, you know, maybe three, four, five distinct values across a very large table. So I might use a bitmap index. For each key, in this case, I'll tick one key of male. The way the bitmap index works is we pick a range of blocks. So we have a start row ID and an end row ID, which indicates a range of blocks. I've picked four here. Inside those four blocks, obviously, some of those rows are going to be have a value of male. The way the bitmap index works, hence the term bitmap, is to indicate within these four blocks in which row positions are males, we store a bit string. So first row was not male, second row was not male, third row was, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Please don't score me on whether those bits actually map to those entries. It's just it's close enough to hopefully give the example. So that's roughly what each bitmap block entry looks like. The question is, why do I choose four blocks? Why wouldn't I choose maybe eight blocks and just have a longer bitmap string? And I can. There is a limit to how many bits we can store because an index leaf block in it is itself limited to the size of a block. Obviously, the more bits we can store and the greater range of rows blocks we can cover, generally the more compact our bitmap index will be. But it's limited, obviously, by the length that this bit string can be and still fit into a leaf block. Ideally though, maybe eight blocks would be better. The reason we have to make a decision here on whether we use four or eight is we need to know how many rows could possibly be in eight blocks. Now, how do we do that? If the table is empty and I create a bitmap index on it, well, I've got no data to work with. I actually have to sort of just assume what's the worst case scenario. And maybe I could assume maybe 4,000 rows in a block. That many rows means a lot of bits I have to store even for a small amount of blocks. I could probably choose eight blocks if I had this many rows per block. What's that? Six, seven rows per block. But if I had this many, maybe I have to drop down to six blocks per key or four blocks. The number of rows that could potentially fit in a block is critical to determining how many blocks I have in each range, which limits to how many bits I have to store. So the Hacken factor is a number that stores the maximum possible rows on a single block for a given table. Why could this be useful for us? If I could nominate 
what the maximum number of rows I'm allowed to have in a single block is, that becomes useful when it comes back to my workflow table. Because in this case, if I said 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, I'm only allowed to have 10 rows in a block, even if they're little small rows like this, they're the brand new orders, then when those rows grow, they will fill the block and I won't have any more dramas. Effectively, it's a different version of insisting upon some free space in a block. Let's look at the hack and factor now to do a demo of that. Here's my online sales table. I've been lazy here. I've just invented a whole stack of columns and really just two columns that are fairly large. These are going to be the two columns that simulate us going from thin rows to fat rows in terms of a workflow style of operation. So I'm going to start off with some simple orders, which are initial orders. So there's nothing in, nothing for the status, nothing for the process. They're all just the first seven columns have been populated and the last two are null. I'm using compute statistics here as opposed to DBMS stats, not because I like analyze, but this is the only one that still gets us the chain count column in user tables. By default, after a simple insert, my chain count is zero. My table is 622 blocks. Now let's do some workflow. I'm going to make those rows bigger by populating the state column to process and the invoice number becomes my invoice number. I've just made every single row larger. Compute statistics. And we initially see what the problem is if we don't allow enough percent free. My table has grown, but that's expected. I've actually made each row bigger. But notice out of my 100,000 rows, almost half or just maybe what, between the third and half of them have now been migrated because they no longer fit. Every index access to those 38,000 rows will now incur a performance penalty. I didn't choose a good percent free for this table. So let's truncate it and repeat the demo as we saw in the slides with a better percent free. I'll make it percent free 50 to allow plenty of space. I insert my brand new orders once again without the state and invoice number populated. This is the start of the workflow. Now I'll go ahead and update all those rows and make them larger, the thing that caused all the migration first time round. Compute statistics, fantastic. The table blocks have grown, but my chain count is zero. I chose an appropriate percent free such that all the rows could grow and not have to be migrated. If this was all the demo was doing, I'd be happy, I'd be happy with this. But as I said, this customer wanted to do the occasional alter table move not just a move in isolation, they wanted to do some uh, attribute clustering, but in this case, I'm just moving the table. Because percent free is 50, I compute statistics. Yes, my chain count is still zero, which is great, but my table's gone from 1,000 blocks to 1,655 blocks. It's now almost, what, 40% of empty space. That will slowly over time be refilled again with new entries, but it's going to take time and any kind of analysis like full table scans are going to incur a performance penalty until that occurs. So let's now truncate it. Let's set percent free one because I'm not going to worry about percent free anymore. As we said, to calculate the hack and factor, the database wants to know the theoretical maximum number of rows to put in a block. I can actually force that number onto the database by doing the following. I'm going to populate enough data in the table to at least fill one block. This fills up a few, but doesn't matter, as long as I fill up one. And I've fully populated the row. So these are random samples of, you know, just basically garbage data, but they will be fully populated rows. They're an indication of how big the table the rows will ever get. And then I run this command. I hate this command because it's, I hate the word records because I like the term rows, but alter table online sales, minimize records per block. Counterintuitively, what that is saying is work out the maximum number of rows I can find in any block, and that is going to be my hard limit from now on. It's ideal for creating compact bitmap indexes, but we don't care about that. We care about the fact that, about the fact that the database now has stored an upper limit on the number of rows that can go on each block in this table. I truncate my garbage data out and now do it in the normal, genuine data fashion. I insert my rows with the two nulls at the end, so their workflow initiation. I compute statistics. I'm at 1,000 blocks with a chain count of zero. Notice the 1,000 blocks is roughly the same as what we had when we had percent free 50. 
the database has refused to let those small rows fill up blocks. It's spread them out. I update all my rows and make them all larger. I compute statistics and I'm still at a thousand blocks and my chain count is zero. This is the same as when we had percent free 50. I've managed to fill in all that blank space in those existing thousand blocks. But now when I alter table move, compute statistics, the chain count is zero, the number of blocks has not gone up, the database has just been effectively moved in situ. I haven't had that growth. I haven't had to diddle percent free numbers, etc. The database now knows that for this table, I'm only allowed an upper limit of this many certain rows per block. Sadly, can you see the hack and factor in the data dictionary? Not by default. Is it actually stored um, on the tab dollar internal dictionary table that sits underneath DBA tables? It's in the column called spare one, uh, encrypted in a certain way. Um, that's all I'll probably be prepared to divulge, but you can find it out. Google will help you out there. But yes, it's, not unfor it's unfortunately not exposed as a genuine column in the data dictionary. I think the hack and factor is a cool option because you, we're thinking outside the box here. We're not using it for bitmap indexes. We're using it to satisfy another problem, a very common problem, and that is rows that grow over time in a workflow style arrangement. Mm -hmm.